Welcome to my uh, video lecture on Laplace transform and uh, <clears throat> continuation of concept of shifts. Uh, this is the second part of the video lecture uh, and here I'll be talking about introducing you guys to step functions and how um, they are used in the world of sciences and engineering and how you could uh, take a function and, and attach a step function to it and what does that mean from a uh, practical point of view. And uh, we'll take it from there. So let's uh, let's start by uh, repeating what I uh, closed the video lecture with last time. Uh, a unit step function um, is written usually as u of t minus a. Uh, well, let's let me give you the very fundamental one. U of t is uh, zero and one. It's zero if t is less than zero, and it's one if t is greater than one. Or equal to one. Now here, that some people put the equal with the with the top condition. Some people put the equal with the bottom condition. It doesn't matter. That's a, a subjective thing. The point is that there's a jump discontinuity here. So if I draw the axes, and here's my t axes, and here's my uh, f of t axes, and uh, my origin is zero, obviously. So my unit step function will be zero before that. So if I use a red color and uh, make it a bit thicker, so my uh, function will be zero to the left uh, at zero and at zero it becomes one to the right. And again, the endpoint is a completely subjective process. So it's up to whoever is writing it. It doesn't matter. The point is that there is a a jump discontinuity here at zero. So uh, and that's what uh, makes it difficult to deal with because we you know jump to the function is not differentiable at a jump point. So so that's called a step function and also we know it as a switch function. Now to write it on a shifted scale you could write it as u of t minus a, that's a unit step function that's moved a unit to the right. And here you're talking about a function that's zero up to a and at a it becomes uh, one because unit step function itself is the unity, um, it's an identity element, so it's always a one. Uh, so let me just uh, write it for you uh, or draw it for you even better. So let me show you how this looks. So t axes, f of t axes, this is a. So my function is zero until a. And at a, it becomes one. Let's say that's one. And there's a jump discontinuity at a here. And that's the uh, formal definition of a uh, general step function. Now, at a and of course you've seen the middle written as a dotted line some people draw it as a solid line that's a, a loose condition there of course you could write this as and i've seen it written as u sub a of t it just means a step function that's shifted by a unit so both these notations are valid now we have a let's look at a formula and see how a unit step function can help us with just the writing of a function so if I have a piecewise defined function, which you see a lot in the engineering world, especially in the forcing functions, where you have a switch or you have some kind of a propulsion system that's driving the system or driving your structure, and uh, it's uh, always broken into, into uh, different time intervals, so it's always a piecewise defined function. So say f of t is um, g of t if t is between 0 and a, so I'm just going to give the equation, equalities all to that condition. And as h of t, if t is greater than a. Now, if I were to draw it for you here, I'm talking about a function, a piecewise defined function that looks like this. Let's just assume whatever, that's the t and let's call it y. Um, I don't want to call it f, g, or h, so it's just a generalized uh, axis uh, for the dependent variable. So between 0 and a, and assuming that's a, so between 0 and a, I have a function that looks like a g of t. So let's say that's g of t. And uh, 
and greater than a, I have a function that's a, that's a, that's h of t, and it necessarily doesn't have to be at that cross point. So this could be my h of t. Okay, so that's you know, if you're looking about this continuous point, and here's a jump discontinuity there. And now the point, the question is, how do I write this as a single function? And why would you want to do it? Well, because it's obvious if, if you've seen it before in differential equations that if your forcing function is a single function, the non-homogeneous part, then it's easier to solve it rather than it's a piecewise defined function, especially with a jump discontinuity. And uh, differentiation is not doesn't like it. Laplace transform doesn't like it. So, so it's always desirable to be able to write f of t as a single function. And with using step functions, you could do that because you could write you could write f of t as g of t, because that's what you start with, right? g of t. And then if you just write g of t, then it will just continue. This function will continue as a g of t. So I'm just going to draw it right parallel to it. So the function will just continue as a g of t, and that's what it would look like. But but you don't want it to, but you it's a piecewise defined function. So what do you do? You want to kill the blue function, which is the g of t at this point. You want to kill that at the point a. Uh, and then you want f to, I mean, h to start after that. So what do you do? You, you stop g of t, so you, you subtract and you hit it with a step function at that point, so u of t minus a. And then you want, you want the h of t to start at that point, then you add, because now I want, at this point, I've, I started with g of t, then I killed it, stopped it, and now I want to start continuing with h of t, so you link h of t to it, so it's obviously plus h of t. But if you just write h of t, then it's going to take, and let me change colors here, then now if you just write plus h of t, then h of t will come in, and then all this part will be included too. So you want to you wanna add h of t only starting at this point right here. You don't want this area of h of t to be present, so you have to kill everything before a. So you say times the unit step function t minus a. And this will kill everything to the left of a for, a for h because that's where h shouldn't be and that's where g is hanging out. And that's how you actually could write a piecewise defined function as a single function. An interesting concept. And you do this a lot in engineering and, and, uh, and especially electrical engineering. So let me look at another example here uh, and see if we could do that. Let me give you a, a, a three piece wise, a three piece piece wise defined function. So let's look at this f of t, which is uh, zero if t is between zero and a. Uh, it's g of t uh, if t is between a and b. Actually, let's just go there and give that equal, give this equal here. And uh, greater than b is just zero. There we go. So now we don't have double values here. All right. So now how would you write that as a um, single function? Well, remember, this is just the, let me draw it for you. This is just the function g of t that's been cut off at a and b. So if, if, if this is my g of t, and this is a and this is b, then all this means is the two, uh, the, the, the conditions, the zero conditions, so between zero and a, so that's zero. So that part is zero. Greater than b is zero, so that's zero. So that only means that g only exists between a and b, and this is the only part of g that's alive in this function. And that's it. So that's what this function is talking about. It's talking about the function g of t between a and b. Now, how can I write that as a single function uh, with uh, g of t present? Well, remember, uh, I, that, well, there are two ways to do it. One way to look at it logically, the other way is just look at it as a formula. Uh, let me do it a bit logically. So f of t is equal to, so obviously I'll start with g of t because I'm trying to model g of t. 
Okay, well, if I just say f of t is equal to g of t, well, g of t will just continue forever, right? So what do I do? I have to kill the, uh, the part to the left of g of t there, so I know I'm certain that it starts at a, because anything less than a, I want to be zero. So I can at this point multiply it by u of t minus a. So at this point, I have my function g that's continuing forever, and I've killed the part to its left at before, uh, uh, before a. So if I were to draw this, it would look at this point. And if this is my uh, g function, I'm trying to look, draw it the same picture, whatever. And if this is b and this is a. Now, all I've done here is to kill all the part of, uh, is to just get rid of this part of g. So this part's gone by introducing this step function, and which means I've turned everything this way zero, but of course it doesn't matter if it start at zero. So I've turned everything to the left of a zero. So I've accomplished that part of it already. So now if I just let this go as is, and I don't do nothing else, I say, okay, there it is, then this is the picture I'll be talking about, so g will just go on forever. But uh, g stops at b, and it doesn't exist after b. So what you do is, So what you do is you obviously have to kill everything after b as well. So again, you have to say minus, and again, g of t times, but this time u of t minus b, and that kills everything, uh, that, uh, everything that's after b. So then obviously you could see, you could write you g of t to factor it out. So you get u of t minus a minus u of t minus b, and you could look at this as a formula. Uh, or you could write this in a more compact notation and say g of t is u sub a of t minus u sub b of t. And that's how you could actually write that function. All right, so let's uh, continue and uh, let's look at another one. Now, let's give you an example as where you have a function and uh, it's a system and you want to turn it off. So you have a function f of t And let's say it's we're going to pick a simple function two t minus three, and you wanna and and you want to kill this function at some value and the, turn the system off. So if that's your system, you want the system to be turned off at some value. So let's say I'm like to turn it off at at a, or a being some some constant value on the x-axis. Now, let me first draw it for you. and that's my f of t axis. All right, so I could draw uh, 2 t minus 3, so the liner sets at negative 3, so it goes through that point, and it also goes through 1 and a half, so if that's 1, 2, 3, so it also goes through that point there. So if I were to draw this function, it would just look, oops, sorry, it would look, Just like that. Now I'm just going to draw it from zero. So that's how your function would look like. So let's now say you want to turn it off at, uh, you, you want to turn this thing, let's say at, at a equals one. So I want to kill this function. I want to kill the signal. I want to kill the system at x as at t equals one. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to make sure that this part is the, the part to the left of one that part is zero. So I'm basically trying to kill that part of this function. Now, how would I do that? Well, I just, now I know, I could just simply multiply that function, but with a unit step function at what point? Right, at one. So now I can just write that as f of t. Otherwise, I have to write a piecewise defined function here. That it's 2t minus three after one and it's zero before one. So, but if I don't want to write a piecewise defined function and I want to just write a single value, I mean, single function, then I could just write this as 2t minus 3, which is a function itself. And all I have to do to turn it off before 1 is to multiply it by the unit step at 1. 
So that becomes my piecewise defined function written as a single function. Very good. So that's uh, that's that's a, that's a concept of the, the, the niceness of, of a unit step function not only being used as a fundamental switch, but but also is written as a, it's used as a as a termination of a signal. Now let's look at. Uh, Laplace transform and uh, trying to apply Laplace transform to the uh, step function. So what I'll do is, uh, and, and, and remember there's a jump discontinuity in step functions and uh, it'll be interesting to see how Laplace transform deals with this jump discontinuity. Now um, I've wrote you the definition of the unit step function at zero and uh, also wrote the definition when it shifted at one. And I also gave you the definition of the uh, box function. So my unit step function at zero is just called u of t. Then I have u of t minus a, or you could write this as u sub a of t. This is a step function that's, that changes, that has that jump discontinuity at a. And then I have the box function, where I write it as u of a, b, t. Or I could write it as u a... Sorry, I could write it as u a t minus u b t, or u of t minus a minus u of t minus b. These are all saying the same thing. So, and that's just a notation, and that's what we call a box function. So, a step function and this we call the box function. Okay, so, and we talked about the fact that uh, introducing uh, the uh, unit step function can actually take a function and if you, you could use, you sh shut down a part of it, or if you want to shut down both ends of it, you hit a function with the box function. So let's look at our main concept, and that is to take the uh, Laplace transform of the step function. Now by definition, uh, Laplace transform is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st f of t dt and uh, my f of t here is u of t. Well it's it's very convenient because u of t is zero less than zero so and the Laplace starts at zero so it's it that's a seamless uh, seamless connection there and uh, so I don't need to do anything or worry about anything and you and after zero, uh, u of t is just one, so I don't even need to write uh, u of t here. Uh, I can just write one. So that just becomes the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus s t d t, and that's simply one over. That's right. You guessed it. One over s for s greater than zero. Now, but but now I guess. Uh, Right now, I'm, I'm sure you're saying, well, but that's interesting because Laplace transform of one is also one over S. And uh, so therefore, if I say uh, this makes the issue for the Laplace inverse, where I say, well, what's Laplace inverse of one over S now that you've learned the step function, now what are you gonna do? Are you gonna say the answer is one? Or are you gonna say the answer is U of T? And uh, and what's happening with that? And by the way, here s is greater than zero. So that's an interesting concept, and that makes the uniqueness an issue. So so the main question is, what is Laplace inverse of one over s? Uh, up to now, we all used one, uh, but uh, now one is not good enough. So we have the Laplace transform of u of t is 1 over s, uh, saying this one more time, Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s, and uh, here we see an issue of finding the Laplace inverse and trying to get a unique answer, because now Laplace inverse of 1 over s, you could call it a uh, u of t, or you could call it 1, so both of these could be an answer. So the question is, how do we make Laplace inverse unique, and which one do we use? Well, see, the problem here, the reason this happens is because Laplace transform is not interested in the past. And um, what that means is if, if you have a function, say, and I'm trying to show you why is it that the Laplace transform of a function may not be the same as the Laplace transform of its inverse uh, in terms of the uniqueness. So, 
for example, if I have f of t and I take the Laplace transform of f of t, the result is f of s and it's unique. And it seems to be that the Laplace transform of f of s, if you take the Laplace inverse of f of s, then f of t is not unique. And uh, what do I pick for f of t? Not unique. And why? Well, it's not that difficult to explain it, so let's look at this. And I think the, the whole reason why is because Laplace transform doesn't care about the past, about less than zero. So that's why information gets lost. And what I mean is the following. Say you have a function f of t. Here's my f of t. And let's say you want to find the Laplace transform of this function. Now, let me continue drawing this function on the left side. There we go. So here is complete f of t from negative infinity to positive infinity. And you take the uh, Laplace transform of f of t. Now the Laplace transform of f of t by definition is the integral from 0 to infinity, and I'm not going to write the rest. So it's the integral from 0 to infinity, so if you think about it, uh, the Laplace transform is only focusing on f of t after 0. So it's only focusing on that part of f of t. And, and this this left side of f of t is not even considered. It just it doesn't care about the negative values, Laplace. So therefore, all the information about that part of the graph is lost as if it never existed. Now imagine if your function f of t looked the way it did on the positive side, but on the negative side, it looked like this. Oops, let me, yeah. So on the negative side, it looked like that. Now, what's the Laplace transform of this new red function? which is another version of f of t. Well, the Laplace transform of that red function is the integral from 0 to infinity. So you notice, again, it focuses on the same positive part of f of t, so it doesn't matter if, if the left tail end of it, it doesn't matter if the left tail of it looks like this, and it doesn't matter if it looks like that, or it doesn't matter how it looks like, even if it's discontinuous, like it starts here and goes back up, so it doesn't matter how the left-hand side looks like, every time you take the Laplace transform of f of t, all this left-hand side gets lost because the integral starts at zero. So, so therefore, when you're finding the Laplace transform, you always get the same function you're working with, but when you're trying to find a Laplace inverse, where does this uh, f of s function come from in terms of f of t, you would know which f of t it is because all the information on the left was lost because Laplace transform doesn't care about any of that. So, so that's why the inverse Laplace transform becomes not unique because then you don't know which one it was. Now, how do you make the inverse Laplace transform unique? So if you have a function here, and I'm going to draw it again. So you've got a function here, f of t, and it's got some kind of a tail end to it on the left. So here's my f of t. And you have all these other uh, continuation of possibilities of it. And how do you make this unique so that I don't have to worry about different possibilities? It's, I mean, the concept is, I mean, the idea is not that convoluted. It's quite simple. It just says, okay, you want it unique? Just since the left-hand side doesn't matter and Laplace transform doesn't care about the negative areas, just, just make the left-hand side zero drive everything to zero so that there is nothing on the left hand side so that the Laplace inverse will always bring you back to the same function and make it unique and that's what makes it unique now how do you how do you do that how do i push f of t to zero when it's uh, in a negative territory well that's the very definition of a, of a of a unit step function that's that's the very job of a step function that's what it does so in order for me to make the inverse Laplace unique and, and get rid of all those possibilities on the left and turn them all to zero, all I have to do is multiply my function by a step function. And that fixes it. And it drives everything to zero on the left. And then when you're finding the inverse Laplace, now you have only one function to go back to, and that makes it unique. So, so therefore, uh, between the two here, we would always go with u of t. So that's just more, more comprehensive, more so it's umbrellas, all the possible subcases. All right, so let's uh, move on here. Now, we've gotten an idea of, uh, of uh, Laplace transform of uh, 
U of T and being 1 over S and Laplace inverse of 1 over S being U of T. So now let's uh, try to find the Laplace transform of the step functions and see how that works out. Now we find the Laplace, so the idea is what is the Laplace transform of um, f of t minus a and why am I going to f of t minus a talking about unit step functions because if you're going to make the left hand side of the function zero f of t minus a is going to cause a problem for us and uh, I'm going to show you why that is and once we get over that then we'll move on and actually now do Laplace transform of a whole bunch of uh, functions that involve and Laplace inverse of a whole bunch of functions that involve um, the unit step function. So let's start by looking at uh, Laplace transform of f of t minus a with a translation and mind you this whole concept in textbooks is called vertical a horizontal translation in t and horizontal translation in s and that's what we'll be working on right now. But before I get into all the Laplace and Laplace inverse of all kinds of functions with shifts and translations and, and, and the unit step function being involved, first we need to see how we could find a Laplace transform of a function that has been shifted by a units and see if we could somehow try to find a Laplace transform of this thing using f of t itself originally. And the reason we're doing this one more time again, if you look at this, um, if, if I get rid of everything on the left, right in this picture, and then I take that function and I move it to the right, see that same f of x, so I'm going to take that function and move it to the right. So, I'm, so now let's say this area here that was, and I'm going to take that, this function being the continuation of f of t, so make it red right there. So let's say that's my original function. And see if I move it to the right, this part of the function that was dead now becomes alive. And that becomes a problem. So that's why it's important for us to, so that that red part becomes here. Yeah. So this part that was dead before and we had no information about now is in the picture. So we need to know, and why did it die is because of introduction to a step function. That's why I'm introducing it here. So the question is, how do I find the Laplace transform of f of t minus a without using the definition? And here we see that we can't do that because we had lost information about a part of the graph when we did the Laplace transform of f alone that we can use that to find f of t minus a, unfortunately. And why would you even want to use the Laplace transform of f of t to find the Laplace transform of f of t minus a? Because as you noticed before, it's always easier to use techniques and um, things you knew about Laplace transform to be able to figure out the Laplace transform of a new thing based on the old thing. Uh, so that's why we always want to be able to do it so that we can bypass the need for using a definition. Uh, I'm gonna try to do this with a picture one more time so you could clearly see why these two cannot be uh, Laplace transform of f of t cannot be used to find the Laplace transform of f of t minus a. So I'm just going to do one picture. So if I draw a function f of t, and let's say my function looks like this. So here's my f of t. And it starts at minus, say, a. You see, now the Laplace transform of f of t, because of the definition of 0 to infinity, ignores this part of the function ignores this part of the function. So Laplace transform of f of t doesn't care about that green part. Why? Because the definition starts from zero. So, so that part gets lost. So Laplace transform of f of t has nothing to do with that green area, I mean green curve. But you see now, if I want to find the Laplace transform of uh, f of t minus a, You see now this function is going to have to shift uh, to the right by uh, a unit. So I'm going to put the a here. So so this so green and blue function is completely shifting to the right. So I'm going to use a, uh, a let's say a red color so you can see it. So so this point here shifts here. This point here shifts here. So now my function looks like the shifted version of f of t by a units. So that, that shift is A, and so is this shift. So the function shifted at 
by a units so now you notice the, the that the green part let me draw the green part again see now the green part now see the green part now happens to be a part of the new Laplace transform and it's included because it's the positive area but you don't get any information from it from the f of t so that's why you can't use um, f of t to find a Laplace transform of f of t minus a because you have no information about this area of the new f of t which is f of t minus a so you couldn't have used f of t to find f of t minus a we have to come up with some kind of a new definition for um, for what f of t minus a is uh, now remember the idea is to kill everything to the left so that it becomes unique right so if i'm moving it to the left then i have to come up with some kind of a theorem that deals with laplace transform of f of t minus a and, and recover all the information all right so let's look at how we're going to do that so we're going to talk about uh, and these are known as translation formulas So the first trans, the two translation formulas we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be taking the Laplace transform of u of t minus a, f of t minus a, and we do that. So so we multiply f of t minus a by u of t minus a. So all the left side gets killed. So you don't have to worry about uniqueness here, as we've discussed thoroughly. So basically, if I were to draw what that means, and we'll draw it here again. So here's my function. I mean my axes. And then I'm going to draw, it, draw f of t, which started there. And then it shifted, and this was a. Then it shifted, minus a. Then it shifted by a units. So it shifted by a units. Then it became here. I'm going to draw that in green. So shifted there. Shifted there. So now it became like that. So that's my new f now, starting at 0 instead of starting at negative a. And that red part got lost, so this part we have no idea about from coming back from A. And since we don't have any idea about that part, and if we still want to use uh, the function f of, f of t to find something about the new green function in terms of its Laplace transform, then, and to make sure it's unique, then we need to drive that red part to zero since we don't have any information from it because it was on the negative territory back where the original f of t was. Because this is f of t, this is f of t minus a. So how do you drive that to zero? Well, we've shown you how to drive that to zero. You just, if you just multiply that by a step function, the yellow part, and you see the yellow part just kills the red part and brings it to zero. And that's why we are multiplying by u of t minus a, because that kills the function on the left, so you don't have to worry about that missed information about it. So, so... That's why we write it the way we write it. Now, what is the Laplace transform of u of t minus a, f of t minus a? Now, that Laplace transform, guys, is either the minus a s f of s. Now, how do you prove that? It's one of the most important formulas in Laplace transform. So now let's, I'm just going to prove this because it's quite not that complicated. So by definition, uh, then Laplace transform of u of t minus a f of t minus a would be the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st u of t minus a f of t minus a dt. Now obviously here we're going to need a substitution so we let uh, t1 be t minus a so dt1 is dt and t is t1 plus a so there we go so now we take all these values and substitute it in the integral so e to the minus st becomes e to the minus s t1 plus a uh, u of t minus a is t1 so it becomes u of t1 f of t1 dt1 now the limits of integrals it's zero to infinity but remind you is t is t from equal to zero to t go to infinity so i go to this formula here 
substitution formula. If t is zero, then my new t1 will have a lower limit of minus a, right there. And if t is infinity, then t1 is just infinity. So there is my uh, new integral. Now here, I can take out the s, either the negative sa, because that's a constant. So it becomes the integral from negative a to uh, infinity. Uh, e to the minus sa comes out because it could separate itself. So e to the minus sa comes out. So I'm left with e to the minus st1, u of t1, f of t1, dt1. So e to the minus sa. So now since u of t1 is zero for t less than zero, well actually t1 less than zero, then then this integral could very simply start at zero without loss of generality because everything from between minus a and zero doesn't count because u of t kills it. So I could just write this integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus st1, and then u of t1 after zero is one, so just replace u of t1 with one, so it disappears, and you have this definition. But t1 is an arbitrary variable, guys, in integration, so we all see that this is just e to the minus sa, and this is very definition of Laplace transform of f of t1, which is a just, just a dummy variable, which ultimately becomes e to the minus sa f of s. So that's why it, that is what that is. So that's how do you prove that the... The plus transform of u of t minus a f of t minus a is e to the minus a s f of s. And that's a very, very important theorem. Now, there is another one that follows it, and the one that says, well, what if I say, let's find the Laplace transform of mm, uh, u of t minus a, but f of t without the shift, without that horizontal translation. And with simple, since I've proved the previous case, this one just follows through that with a simple substitution. I'm not going to bother with this one. I'm just going to give you the formula that becomes just e to the minus a s Laplace transform of f of t plus a. And that's the formula for that. And I'm just going to write the other one here as well. So I have both of them next to each other, f of t minus a. And this one is e to the minus a s cap f of s. Okay, so you recall that. Very good. Now, and and if I say, then what about if I just find the Laplace transform of u of t minus a? So let's write that as well. You see here, u of t minus a is times 1. So, so this just becomes e to the minus uh, a s. Right? So this just becomes e to the minus a s, right, because of the shift on the step function, and f of s is 1 over s. So the Laplace transform of just a simple unit step function without any variable function multiplied to it, multiplied by a constant function 1, becomes e to the a s, e to the minus a s over s. So that's the Laplace transform of uh, u of t minus a. So using these three formulas now, we should be able to now attack some uh, functions and find their Laplace transforms. So let me give you a few examples here uh, before we move on to speaking about convolutions and, uh, and the Laplace transform of integrals, which is coming up. So let's use some of these translation theorems to do some examples. Let's start with the box function. And by the way, mind you that the Laplace transform of the new of t without a shift, don't forget, is a 1 over s. All right, so let's look at the box function here as our first example. Now, you recall what the box function was. u of a, b of t is u a of t minus u b of t. And this is a compact notation. It will be u of t minus a minus u of t minus b. So that becomes our box function, u of a, b of t. Okay, and I'm sure you recall that box function. I've drawn it for you. All 
Okay, so now how do you find the Laplace transform of U of AB? Well, that you could just write as Laplace transform of U of T minus A minus the Laplace transform of U of T minus B. Now, Laplace transform of U of T minus A is e to the minus AS over S. And Laplace transform of U of T minus B is e to the minus BS over S. So you could write it like that. Or you could factor out a 1 over S and write it as e to the minus AS minus e to the minus BS. You write it any way you want. So that's how you find the Laplace transform of a box function. Uh, let's give it another example. Let's say I want to find the Laplace transform of, let's give it a shift at 1. Uh, and let's say I want to find the Laplace transform of t squared times u of t minus 1. So here I'm finding the Laplace transform of a function without a horizontal shift times the unit step function that scaled everything before 1. So I'm looking at this formula here and just remind you. So I'm looking at this formula here. Okay, so you should have these formulas initially before you've completely memorized them written right in front of you so that you could have it on the side on a formula sheet so you could keep referring to it until it sort of get, becomes subconscious and becomes a muscle memory. All right, so let's continue. So that's the Laplace transform we're trying to find. Okay, so how does that work? Well, it says Laplace transform of U of T minus 1 T squared is e to the minus as e to the minus as times Laplace transform of f of t plus a so that becomes e to the minus as now here what's e to the minus as it will just be e to the minus 1s so e to the minus s is how you start with and then the Laplace transform of whatever this function is evaluated at t plus 1, so it will be t plus 1 quantity squared. Well, but that's easy though, that's from the way past, so that's just all you have to do is just open that up. And this becomes e to the minus s, and the Laplace transform of t squared is 2 over s cubed. Laplace transform of 2t is 2 over s squared, and Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s. And uh, there it is. Perfect. So that's that example there for a second Laplace transform. And now let's look at an inverse Laplace transform, see how that works out. So let's say now I want to find the inverse Laplace transform of the following function. Okay, so because of that exponential factor e to the minus pi s there, you know you're dealing with uh, discontinuous functions in time domains, piecewise defined function, which brings in the step function. So that's a major indicator for that. So you know that your solutions are going to be dependent on step functions and they're going to be a piecewise defined situation there when you get back the function in time domain. Well, the first thing I can do here is I could split these apart. So I could write this as 1 over s squared plus 1 plus Laplace inverse of e to the minus pi s over s squared plus 1. Now, if this was the beginning of the Laplace transform chapter and you'd look at this first Laplace inverse, then you'd have simply written this as, oh, that's easy, that's just sine of t. But you can't just write that as sine of t because from initially, based on this, uh, based on this, the fact that you had an e to the minus pi s in, or e to the minus something in the problem, we knew that the function in time domain is going to be dependent on step functions and it's going to be a piecewise defined function. So therefore, the Laplace inverse of 1 over s squared plus 1 must be written as u of t as sine of t. So let's not forget that. And then plus... Now Laplace inverse of e to the minus pi s over s squared plus 1. Now that, just recall, and I'm going to write this in another color here. Actually, let's try it with red. So recall that Laplace inverse of e to the minus a s 
f of s is u of t minus a, f of t minus a. So recall that. And based on that, now I can very simply figure out the Laplace inverse of u to the minus pi s over s squared plus 1. So that'll just be plus u of t minus a. Uh-huh. That's right, which becomes u of t minus pi now, because that's what a is here. Times the function uh, of t minus a, the inverse function of t minus a, which is sine of t. So it would be sine of, but t minus a, so t minus pi. So that becomes, so, so this is when t is greater than or equal to pi, this part. And this part is uh, t greater than zero. So, and that becomes my Laplace inverse. Now I could write that as a step function. If you wanted to see what it, what it was, if without a, a step function, I could write it as a piecewise defined function. Well, in the beginning, I mean, everything else is zero when it's sine of t. So I think if t is between zero and pi. See, this is only, this is only alive when t is greater than pi. Uh, and less than zero, nothing is there. So between zero and pi, the function is just sine of t times one, which is sine of t. And when, it, when t is greater than pi, then it becomes u of t minus pi sine of t minus pi. The u of t minus pi goes away because now we're writing it as a piecewise defined function, so we don't need the step function anymore. So it just becomes uh, sine of t plus sine of t minus pi. But what is sine of t minus pi? Sine of t minus pi is minus sine of t. So all in all, that becomes zero. So if I were to write the inverse using a piecewise defined function, I'd say it's equal to sine of t when t is between zero and pi, and it's zero if t is greater than pi. This is the piecewise version of that. Thank you.